Let's stop right there. <laughs> this is too good. That, <laughs> seriously. I'm, 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 I saw the sheet over there with the... Uh, <laughs> Co the key? Yeah. There's a color key. Uh-huh. Good sheet. You could just like point out and say, oh, so tell me about that. Uh, and then, you know, say the name of the material. Yeah. And then, <laughs> how does John know that? How does he know that? Right. He knows everything. Oh my gosh, we got a bunch of questions so, already. So, this, this won't matter. Does that hood actually go through the paint shop? Yes. I mean, it looks, it looks great. I mean, looking on the screen here, how you can see the... Yeah. I mean, the color is... is okay, but don't answer. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I want to thank everybody who's already uh, tuned in live. We're already starting to get questions, and of course, you guys are going to know in a minute. Oops. Chad Harrison, the chief engineer on the Honda Odyssey minivan, is joining us right now. If you want to shoot a question in about it during the course of our conversation, shoot us an email, send it to viewer mail at autoline.tv, and we'll take a phone call too, and that number is 620-288-6546. And we'll get going in just a minute. Just a second. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Mr. Gary Vasilash. How are you, John? I'm doing pretty good. You know, I think I think we gotta we gotta say right at the start that today is the hundredth anniversary of the first purpose-built truck, pickup truck by Ford. So all those people are watching it live. Go Today's out. the day. Today's the day. Go out and celebrate with your F-150. Yeah, kiss it. The TT. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good stat there. We got to let everybody know, Lindsey Brook from SAE International is with us here, and it's great to have you here. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Yeah, good. And our special guest for the day is Chad Harrison, the chief engineer on the Honda Mid Odyssey minivan. And Chad, welcome aboard. Thank you very much for having me. And, and you brought a car. We brought a car. A cutaway. Cutaway. Yeah. And this is a spectacular piece of property that you got here. A brand new minivan that's all chopped up. You must have a blast chopping this thing up. Yeah, our fabrication guys really like making this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, how do you do this? I mean, obviously, this thing went down the assembly line. I mean, it looks too good not to have done that, right? It, yeah, is that how it yeah, starts out? It starts as a complete vehicle, and then we start taking it apart and painting different sections, uh, different colors to highlight the structure in that area. Uh, and then just try to show off some of the technology that went into the, the car, especially under the skin. Most people are used to seeing just the car from the outside. This is what's inside. So somewhere in Spokane, Washington, a customer is saying to the dealer, where the hell is my <laughs> van? <Yeah. laughs> This one, this one might have been a pre-production engine. I'm positive it was. <laughs> okay, so, so it has different colors. Okay, so we're seeing green and red and pink. Uh, what do they signify? Well, uh, in this case, we chose to highlight uh, kind of more major structure components uh, in, with different colors. You can also do it by materials. Um, but when you do it with materials, it kind of just turns into a big kaleidoscope and you can't really tell what's going on exactly. So the orange up here at the front is the front crash structure. We've highlighted in pink what we call uh, our hot stamp door ring. It's a one-piece uh, hot stamp part. It's very strong and protects the passenger compartment. Uh, the green in here is just the overall general floor structure, which a lot of people would refer to as the platform. Uh, and then there's some purple up the top that's just highlighting the roof structure. So it's really just the major components of the car. Okay, who came up with pink? I'll be honest with you, our guys uh, picked a color in our CAD system, and our fab guys matched it exactly to that color. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I walked in the studio, I saw that pink door ring, and I just started laughing. It was so unexpected. It's very well differentiated from everything. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, so th this hot stamp door ring, now we had the MDX uh, cut mm -hmm. 
cut vehicle, the MDX, that, that had a large similar thing. Is that, is that where yeah, you guys got the very, idea? It's very similar. MDX, Pilot, Ridgeline, Odyssey all have that structure. It's, the, it's an efficient way to maintain all of the crash energy that's coming into the cabin, especially with IHS's small overlap test. A lot of energy comes into the cabin and the hot stamp door ring helps us manage that as efficiently as we possibly can. So that helps in a frontal collision? It absolutely does. How? All the, all the load in a frontal collision ends up there at the base of the A-pillar coming through the wheel and the chassis. You just got to make sure that you can maintain that energy and stop it there. You don't want oh. it to come into the cabin. Now, Chad, with all the industry kind of interest in aluminum, you guys really seem to be pushing steel alloys uh, in this body structure. Why? Well, uh, we, we try to pick the most efficient structure, from, especially from a weight perspective and strength and cost. We've got to balance all those things to, to meet all the requirements. Um, in this case, especially we're talking about the Dora ring, ultra high strength, 1500 me megapaxel steel is the, the best for that. For an area like the hood, which is all aluminum, aluminum skin and aluminum uh, frame, uh, that's the best application for that material there. I, that's all I can tell you. It's, mm. it's, we're finding the best optimized solution for the, the problem that's put in front of us. And your team was able to still get weight out of this versus the previous iteration, right? Yeah, that's not always done with materials. Obviously, materials help reduce weight, but just really smart engineering and a bunch of guys working together to find the best solution is, is how it works. How much lighter is it? Um, it's up to 75 pounds lighter than the outgoing model uh, in, in the biggest trim. That's pretty good. And let's go back to this orange structure, which is for the, the small overlap. I, Gary brought it up. We had the MDX in here. As I look at this, I mean, it's, it looks like the flying buttress of some old cathedral or something mm -hmm. like that. But it doesn't look, and I'm trying to remember, because this, this goes back, what, a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like this is thinner, not as bulky as what we saw there. Is, is that right? Are you guys getting better at designing these things? Of course, we always get better as we evolve the designs. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm going to say it a few times, just trying to optimize to meet the problem. So obviously, crash standards evolve over time. Uh, in this vehicle, we had to focus very much on the IHS small overlap test, which is unbelievably demanding. Right? A lot of energy from the car going into a very small frontal area of it, basically right through the wheel. So. That structure has been through thousands of iterations to try to find the right solution uh, with the lowest weight and the lowest price. Now, Honda also has really pushed the envelope in terms of virtual crash testing or designing for virtual crash. Uh, how closely did your physical properties correlate with your virtual designs? Unbelievably closely. Um, you know, we, we do a ton of development before we ever make a physical prototype. Um, so uh, the, when we ran the physical crash test, almost identical to what we did in a, in a computer-aided engineering world. Um, very few modifications were required to meet all of our requirements after we made a physical prototype. Great. But you still build the physical prototype. We still do on a certain level. Um, it, it's not as extensive as it has been in the past. We, we are confident enough in decisions to make some mass production tools or a lot of mass production tools with our CAE. Mm -hmm. But we also, of course, we're going to check the car and make sure that it meets our intention before we ever sell it to the customer. So a minivan is generally considered to be the most family of family vehicles. Absolutely. Now, as chief engineer, did you, did you feel a certain sense of obligation to maybe go a little above and beyond when you're looking at safety? Yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure that this is the safest car we could possibly make for, for, uh, for our customers. And as you said, it's families. You've got the most precious cargo possible in the car most of the time. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so are you going to get the IIHFS Top Safety Pick Plus? Uh, we expect that for especially the crashworthiness portion of this, we will. Yeah, and but the plus comes from having some automatic braking and yes, things and we, like that, right? We have, yeah, we have 95% uh, uh, of our cars, everything above the base LX grade, have what we call the Honda Sensing Suite, which is a uh, collision mitigation braking system, adaptive cruise control, uh, lane keeping assist system, and road departure mitigation. Additionally, uh, all those grades in the Odyssey have blind spot indication system. So. We're trying to make it so you don't get in the crash in the first place. If you do get in the crash, we're confident that the crash worthiness of this car is as good as anything out there. Yeah. You know, in addition to ultra high strength steels, 
that are being deployed in a variety of uh, vehicles. One of the things we're hearing more and more often is utilization of adhesives to supplement the spot welding. Sure. Are you guys doing any here? Yeah, actually, if you look on this model, the, the yellow spots there at the back are where we uh, increased our structural adhesives. We've always used structural adhesives throughout the car. It's, it allows you to uh, use less weld but have a similar strength or uh, the same strength of a section without adding mass. Um, and in this, in this situation, we focus most of our new application in the rear of the car. That was an area where uh, it was a little bit neglected in some of the minivans in the past. So we made sure that we uh, added the right amount of structural adhesive back there to meet our overall body rigidity targets, which are honestly less about crash safety than they are about ride and handling and noise vibration and harshness. So, so if, if it was neglected in the past, how would someone perceive that? I mean, what would the, if, if somebody drove this and they drove whatever else, what well, would they sense? Uh, in, in this case, when we're talking about the adhesive here, it's uh, especially in handling maneuvers, the connection between the front and the rear. Minivan is an unbelievably challenging body to make stiff, right? <laughs> it's this big square with a bunch of holes cut in it for doors. <laughs> so um, so we, we want to make sure that the, you know, the, the previous Odyssey was one of the best handling minivans. We think the best handling minivan, but we wanted to go above and beyond with that. And it's not about max skid pad numbers or anything like that. It's just about confident, intuitive dynamics in everyday driving. And even just a small lane change on the highway, if the front and the rear have any delay between them, you, you can feel that. I'm sure you've all felt that when you drove a car. So this car has 44% more torsional rigidity than the outgoing model. That was something that we very much focused on, as well as improved local rigidity at a lot of the suspension fitting points, which of course increases or improves handling and reduces the path of noise into the cabin. And NVH reduction, noise vibration harshness was a major design driver for this program. But I know your team also made some trade-offs in terms of ingress, egress, uh, functionality of the second row seats. Could you talk about some of the, the, those decisions that you guys made in terms of what features do we want to be primary in this vehicle? Well, I, I wouldn't say there are any trade-offs, Lindsay, necessarily, just uh, we, we prioritized things, right? So, um, of course, the minivan, the package of a minivan is the most important to a customer. It's got to fit our eight passengers, it's got to fit all their stuff, and they have to be comfortable inside. Um, our number one priority on this car was function for young families, uh, and those young families generally have child seats in the car. Um, most of the solutions out there in either SUVs or minivans uh, aren't so great when you've got rear-facing child seats in the car. And what I mean by that is trying to get to the third row. We've got an expensive third row seat, and people buy minivans because of that. Um, trying to get there with the rear-facing child seat in almost anything out there is very, very difficult. So we developed what we call the magic slide seat, um, which allows the uh, outboard seats in the second row with the mid-row center removed to slide towards the inside of the car. Um, and then you can get, even with a child seat installed, you can get easy access to the third row ingress and egress. So we basically built around that concept. So, uh, and then the, the uh, second thing that I talked about body rigidity all earlier, that's for that confident dynamic. So we had to integrate that structure that's, that's the rails of the sliding seat into the body structure to uh, meet all our rigidity targets. So mm -hmm. you can imagine cutting a rail across the car isn't gonna be very efficient. So we use the rail with some steel parts to be the rigid structure. And, and also being a two-time Odyssey owner and having driven this, it's night and day in terms of not having to yell into <laughs> backwards into the vehicle to communicate with I'm, people. I'm, Shut up, I'm you kids! That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm glad you say that. Uh, hey, we got a couple of questions here from viewers. Steve B. wants to know if the Honda VAC is in this van. The Honda vacuum is absolutely in this van and we were able to bring it down one level of trim so it's available on our touring and elite grades which are the top two grades, roughly 25% of our sales plan. Abhi from Canada wants to know, why don't you have all-wheel drive? Well, uh, we believe me, we thought about all-wheel drive, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the minivan package is the most important thing to the customer. Um, and we felt that the sacrifices that you have to make to the basic package when you're packaging a rear differential and a, a prop shaft to make, uh, make all-wheel drive was not worth it in our case. We wanted to focus on everyday family usage. Uh, we've also got excellent dynamics in the winter. Our tires are fantastic. We have what we call a snow mode, which uh, improves traction performance in the snow. We feel it wasn't necessary and we didn't want to make the sacrifice for the package. Tom wants to know, uh, you've got a three and a half liter single overhead cam uh, 
He says, are you going to ever update it to dual overhead cam with a chain drive? I can't speak to any of those future plans right now for the for this. Good question, Tom. For 2018 Odyssey and, and, and uh, the run of this model, we expect it to be. Okay, and then finally, to get back to these guys' questions, uh, Amato wants to know, with the rising sale of crossovers, is the minivan segment still relevant? It's absolutely relevant. Uh, sell over 500,000 units a year. That's a lot. Uh, there's really only three or four main players, so there's a lot of volume available in the minivan segment. Mm -hmm. Speaking did, of did which, you, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you were working on this vehicle, the Pacifica came out. Mm -hmm. Were there any surprises to you as the chief engineer in looking at what they did? And you said to you know, your team, hey, guys, take a pause here. No, there's, there's nothing that we had to change course on. Honestly, we were impressed with the Pacifica. It's a very good vehicle. I'm not going to disparage it. Um, but we're glad that we made all the decisions we did to make the Odyssey as excellent as it is <laughs> to compete with the Pacifica. And we, we think it'll win. Okay, hold your thought right there, Lindsay, because we're going to take a quick break right now because we've got to do this sort of thing. And we're going to give a shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back talking with Chad Harrison, the chief engineer of the Honda Odyssey minivan. And just before the break, I so rudely interrupted you, Mr. Brooks, so please proceed. And I had a perfect segue there. <laughs> but um, Chrysler has done a lot with their stow and go, you know, being able to package things underneath, you know, in the floor system of the vehicle. Chad, did you consider that at all? I think that technology came from Magna originally, and, and Chrysler had first dibs, but now anybody can, can consider that. Yeah, we, we considered every possible seat configuration technology, mm -hmm. but uh, as I said, we're focused mainly on Honda's customer, which is generally a younger family with younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, so we prioritize the magic slide seat that we've created as the best solution for their everyday needs, dropping kids off at school, daycare, activities, as opposed to what we found out was maybe once or twice a year where our customer is removing the seats or using full the full cargo capacity of the van. So we very clearly prioritize that, what we think is an everyday use case versus the once or twice a year use case. So uh, we think this solution is the best for the customer that we're shooting for. And in my case, um, three Labrador retrievers have replaced <laughs> the human child. Uh, and, and some companies look at dogs and dog access. Was that a consideration for the, your interior package at all? Um, I, I would say we considered everything that everybody uses. So the, the, <laughs> the different types of cargo, what we call modules, are limitless, especially when it comes to a minivan. Mm. So yes, we did. And dog kennels are one of the cargo modules we use to check things in size for. And I, I do want to be clear that uh, the Odyssey, you know, the second row seats are removable and it has you know, enough space for a four by eight sheet of plywood and all that stuff. Uh, it's just maybe not as simple a mechanism for that purpose as Chrysler Stow and Go system is. So one of the things that you guys did on this vehicle is really concentrate on the infotainment content and not just for the driver and front seat passenger, and not merely screens in the back as every minivan has. You guys went above that. Tell us about the uh, Yeah, our, our brand new infotainment system, which we call Display Audio, uh, is a kind of a ground up uh, development for this Odyssey. So this is the first time it's applied here, and that will, will apply to, or the base of that will apply to future Honda models. But um, we wanted to make a uh, very intuitive, uh, smartphone-like interface uh, that everybody can very easily understand. So we've got app tiles, customizable settings, very similar to your phone. Um, but as you mentioned, we want to make everyone in the family happy. So uh, we do apply for our rear entertainment system uh, streaming capability, which can be done either by the in-car 4G LTE Wi-Fi or connected to your tethered to your, your smartphone. Uh, PBS Kids is one of the apps that we have back there for that. Um, also, uh, we developed an app internally called Cabin Control, which allows the passengers in the rear of the car to control things like the rear HVAC, 
uh, the rear entertainment system. With an app? Uh, with an app from your phone. So anybody that's got a phone uh, can be given permission from the driver. So <laughs> the driver can say, you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> but they can control all those things, including the front audio. If the, if, so rather than saying, hey, mom, play this radio station for me, they can just play it automatically. Uh, and, and even look up uh, Navi points of interest and send it to the Navi. Mm -hmm. We've got some more questions that have come in here. Kevin wants to know, why was Lane Watch dropped from the 2018 Odyssey and other upcoming Hondas? Well, he, he really liked it, he went on to say. Yeah, Lane Watch is a fabulous technology, and, and I'm not going to disparage that at all. However, we thought in order to make this car as safe as possible, we wanted to apply the, the blind spot information system, um, which is a bit redundant with our Lane Watch system. Blind spot information is, is, has two advantages. One, it's available on both the left and right side of the car, not just the right side of the car. Uh, and it's more of an active system, right? As opposed to just being a, essentially a virtual mirror, it's telling you when somebody, you know, if you're trying to if you turn signals on and you're trying to change lanes and there's someone in there, it will yell at you. Yeah. So for those who don't know, lane watch is basically okay, where you put the right turn signal on that suddenly you see a yes, image it, of what's on the right side right, of the it, car. It's basically a screen, on, screen, on, on, screen in the center shows an image, uh, an, an enhanced image of what the mirror would be seeing. There's a camera inside there's that camera housing. In the mirror, yes. yeah. So improved, uh, improved field of view and guidelines of how far away the car would be. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I totally love that agree. feature. I, I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with why you guys did what you did. But I, as you guys know, every time you'd have somebody in the car, if we were test driving, you'd put that right turn signal on, yeah. they'd all go, that is so cool. Yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it. We struggled a little bit with that because it, I agree, it is the flashier, showier technology. It's the right. stuff you want to show off, but uh, we think blind spot information makes the car safer. Now, Chad, very controversially, across Honda's line, removing actual physical volume <laughs> and on-off knobs on the audio system has been a point of contention. The company seems to be listening and bringing it back. Um, where did Odyssey development stand in that controversy? We, we recognized very early on that the a physical volume knob was very important. <laughs> and we, we added that back in even before we got any of the market feedback on our current cars. So, yeah. uh, that, was, that was one of our early decisions. And it, honestly, you, you guys know vehicle development is just a bunch of choices between what can we give the customer and how much is it going to cost us. Um, so it was a difficult decision, but uh, it's, it's the right one to make. I remember it's a baby boomer thing, you know, that we all grew up with knobs and so... Yeah. We need to crank it. Sometimes you just want to turn it down quick when you're at the drive through right? Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, you always had down. the button on the steering wheel. That's right. Steering wheel That's why I never understood it. all this complaint about it. Yeah, anyway, because we got another question here. Gar Guy Martineau uh, sent us a tweet, wants to know, why would you reduce the seat movement so much? Old Odyssey's driver's seat would raise a few inches. Now it feels almost one inch. Hmm. I don't think that's correct. Okay, uh, yeah, our, our, our seat has uh, a little over two inches of height travel on the okay. driver's seat. Hold the button longer, guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another question came in here uh, from Abby again in Canada. Why is there a stigma with minivans? I wish I could answer that question because for most people uh, that have families, the minivan is the clear correct choice. Uh, when our kids were growing up, we had them. I loved them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, because they were just so practical. They do everything. Right. right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and we, 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 f we chose not to fight that stigma, right? We chose to appeal to people that understand that a minivan is the best choice for their life stage mm -hmm. uh, and make the best one we possibly could. So what other vehicles have you worked on as an engineer? Uh, well, I've worked on many. Uh, I've been, uh, in the past, been responsible for a certain functional area, which is the interior, what we call interior packaging and performance, uh, for pretty much every model that uh, Honda or Honda Research of America has made since 1995. That's how long I've been wow. in the company. Um, I was on the project development team for the 01 MDX and 03 Pilot, kind of Honda's first foray into SUVs. I then went back totally to the, what we call function group technical world, and then uh, came back with a force and was asked to lead this. Good for you. That's so, great. So interior background, so you were picking materials and art? No, uh, well, interior packaging and performance to us is, the, is uh, the, again, the space, cargo space, passenger space, seating comfort. Um, we deal with things like rattle and squeak, trying to make all the, all the things quiet, uh, amenities uh, where 
cup holders, all those kinds of things. That's, that was the area that I was responsible for. It's more representing the customer in setting targets for the design. So for a minivan, this is like ideal for I think that might have been why I was chosen to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that Odyssey and Honda's new 10-speed transaxle were pretty much on parallel development paths, and you were, guys were the first beneficiaries of that. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep, and the 1080 is fantastic. I hope you've all had a chance to drive it. It's uh, very smooth, direct, intuitive. Uh, truthfully, in our application, we want it to be transparent, right? We want to just make a demand with your right foot, and hopefully the car does exactly what it should, and, and I think that's what the 1080 allows us to do. Did the car deliver EPA numbers that you were banking on? Yes, it did. Uh, the, the 1080 was one portion of the fuel economy improvements we've made in the car, including items like shutter grow. We've also already talked about light weighting. Uh, we've got aerodynamic treatment underneath the car. Uh, it, it did deliver what we want. Uh, we were, we're plus one mile per gallon highway from the outgoing car, which may not sound like a lot to everybody, but when you're pushing a rather large vehicle through the air that's mostly a square, one mile per gallon highway is a lot. So what are the EPA numbers? you know them offhand? Uh, yeah, it's uh, 19 city, 28 highway, and 22 combined. Okay. So to get that performance increase in miles per gallon, how much of it is aero and how much of it is mass? And how it, it's, I, I, I can't attribute which portion, but all of those things, aerodynamics, mass, all the friction related with mass, uh, and then the efficiency of the powertrain. We employ a system called variable cylinder management. So when the uh, torque demand is such that we can cut three cylinders off, we cut three cylinders off, uh, and then you're, you're pushing the car down the road with only three cylinders. That, of course, takes some technology to counteract the imbalance that gets created there. Uh, then adding on top of that the 10-speed automatic transmission that has very tall top gears and very tightly spaced, meaning it's always in the right gear pushing you down the road at exactly the, the load that's required. That's the best you can do for fuel economy. More questions from the audience. Brandon Gray wants to know, are you going to have a surround view camera? Surround view camera was one item that we considered. Uh, we, it wasn't prioritized for us at this point with all of the other stuff that we did, but uh, it will be considered for future application. And Amada wants to know, yeah, any thoughts about making these things autonomous? He says it would be great vehicle for autonomy. Uh, I, I honestly can't speak anything about autonomy. I wish I could answer that question, but I very much focused on getting this 2018 Odyssey <laughs> to our customer. I haven't been focused too much on autonomy. So what, what aspect of this are you the proudest of? I mean, is the chief engineer the whole thing, or is there just something about well, it? It's like, you know what, we, we nailed we it. We nailed it, yeah. I, right I think you kind of said it both. The, the, the overall package is I'm very, very happy with where we ended up. Um, but I'll, I'll point back to the magic slide seat again. Um, the engineering challenge to make that happen, especially, as I said, in the face of cost and weight pressure, is was tremendous. Uh, and I'm very proud of the organization for understanding how important it was, how big it was to our concept and making it happen, right? There's many times during our event or our development that we could have decided we need to cancel that because it's too hard or we need to cancel that because it's uh, cost too much money or it weighs too much. We didn't do that. We held firm and, and made it and brought it to market. Chad, other than powertrain, was there any major subsystem development in Japan? This is pretty much an Ohio designed and executed vehicle, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, this is a completely Ohio designed and executed vehicle outside of the 10-speed automatic transmission, which we jointly developed with our counterparts in Japan. Mm. How's the vehicle selling? Uh, sales are good so far. We've only been on sale for about a month, so I can't speak too much about how what we're going to do, but uh, yeah. we were the number one retail sales uh, vehicle for seven years running, and we appear to be on that path again. Oh, because the reason I asked, I'm sure you're still selling out the old one, too. There are so that, that's, I don't have any way of parsing through the numbers. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very successful. It's selling per our plan. Okay. Cool. And hi had hybridization been a consideration, that one thing that Chrysler has that seems unique in the industry? Yeah, it's uh, something we considered and uh, and somewhat considered in our platform development, but as far as application, uh, I can't speak to when that's going to happen, or, and we did strongly consider it at 2018. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that when you were thinking about this magic seat that, you know, nobody said it was too hard. I didn't think that Honda knew things that were too hard. I mean, I just thought you just do them. That's maybe part of it. I think, <laughs> I, I think Honda's, Honda's spirit led us to be able to make that. Real good. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Chad Harrison, thanks so much for coming on, especially for bringing this cutaway. I mean, I, I, I wish I had, uh, I wish we could drive it. That would be the most fun thing to drive this week.
We can, we can push it and get it moving pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real good. Well, we're going to take a quick break right now, give a shout out to our friends at Borg Warner, and we're coming back to talk a lot more about what's going on in the automotive industry. Borg Warner, developing advanced technologies specifically aimed at reducing emissions, increasing fuel economy, and improving performance. Our award winning innovations extend from turbocharging and cooling systems to friction materials and diesel cold start technology. Built on a century long reputation of innovation and reliability, we have the track record that proves our technology can help meet the challenges of the commercial truck and off highway industry. Okay, we're back, and this is the part of the show. Notice the emotion that I'm putting in my oh voice. Oh, my it's God. Time this is, this is, for Dr. Data. Boy, this, is, this is big pressure on me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, for those who watched last week when we were talking about a certain subject, I, I sort of wrapped that thought into this number for this week. So, so Carmen, could you please bring the first slide up? Okay, so it's $285 billion in 2030. So that will represent... That's going to be the minimum wage, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's see, how old will I be yeah. then? Uh, so what might... Uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint, Gary, uh, uh, Lindsay. The, the background that's all blurred out always gives a clue. Except uh, I know the answer, and I don't even know what the background is. $285 billion in the auto industry's investment in autonomy and connected car technology. Wow, that sounds good, but it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it looks like one of those uh, exercise machines that you walk on. So I don't know. I, I have no clue what this number means. It's a smartphone in the background. So, Carmen, bring it up. The size of the global ride-hailing market. Remember we were talking about the uh, decrease in the price of medallions in New York City yeah, right. and that people are beginning to use more and more right. car-hailing? So, so eight times over the current size, according to Goldman Sachs. Now, this is a global number. Yeah, okay, right, so, right, it's still. So we're seeing, but we're, this would include taxis and, you know, well, Lyft see, and Uber. See, I, and, I think when they're talking about ride-hailing, they don't necessarily mean the classic cab. Okay, yellow cab. That is, that, is, that is mainly the uh, smartphone and everything. That thing. is, hmm. well, well, I'll tell you, two years ago, the number for 2020 was 26 billion. That was hmm. the projection of what it would right. go to. Yeah. And now two years later for 2030, you're saying, what was that, 285? 285, yeah. 10X. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. So, so today Ford announced that they were expanding their chariot ride sharing service into New York City. And uh, so, so this is basically they have transit vans and they put, you know, seating for, according to them, more than a dozen people. That's in air quotes. And um, they, they found that 54% of the people who live in Queens are more than half a mile away from a subway station. So they're calling these sort of transportation deserts. So they're saying that, you know, by this chariot system works like an Uber or a Lyft that you, you call it on your, your phone or you... It's you know, on demand. On demand through your... Um, and it's uh, $4 a ride. And what they do is they use analytics to determine the best way to pick people up and drop them off. Now, one of the things that I thought was sort of astonishing was the fact that, uh, you know, they, they were talking about numbers that by having one of these things that they're taking 10 cars yeah. out of service for... For every passenger. For every, no, for yeah. every chariot vehicle. Oh, for, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, so I was thinking about that. It's just like, okay, so that isn't very many many cars, I mean, especially in a place like Manhattan. Right, right. And how many Ford vehicles out of that pie are, would be Ford vehicles mm -hmm. taken out of I, I think it's a big number, actually, Gary. One vehicle replaces 10. Wow. As that starts to scale up, the impact is big. Eventually. Eventually, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, you got to so, start so, Okay, but here's the thing. Yeah. So, so they're saying they will have 60 vehicles in service by this fall, mm -hmm. 600 cars. Yeah. And we talked about this before. Is you is six hundred cars in your lot out there? Mm. <laughs> I, I, look, this is in its infancy. I, I think the impact is is geometric. Yeah, but but how do you? Again, we talked about this before. How do you keep an assembly plant 
loaded with this kind of thing. I mean, yes, the use of those transits is going to be, they're going to be replaced more frequently. So there's more transit business for Ford. Right. But, they're, but they're also taking pass cars out of the picture that are built somewhere else. So how do you balance that out if you're an automaker? It's you don't. You start closing, or you, you do it by closing plants. Right. That's what's going to happen, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, 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 was, I was visiting a machine tool company this morning, Heller, and uh, they do a lot of uh, powertrain work, and uh, they're a German company, and they basically said that uh, they've been in business for 123 years, and they grew up with the auto industry, and so I've been working with the usual suspects in Germany in, in terms of building machine tools that go into building engines. And their, their COO gave us a presentation, and he basically said that for an electric motor, versus an internal combustion engine, you only need one-fifth the number of machine tools to build it, right? So to your point, what happens to engine plants? Right, right. So, I mean, so yeah. you're always going to be building, you know, structural assemblies to stick people in, but my goodness, I mean, if you're, if you're yeah. going down by, you know, 80% in terms of... Uh, Listen, that. there's a study out there by a think tank out of Stanford called Rethinks that says that the SAR is going to drop to 6 million units by 2030. But then how, is, how are the growth regions, China and India, are still far fewer people driving right now and more people that still want to own a car? Right. So are they going to balance this out as the developed world kind of starts, you know, maybe stops driving. I don't think so, because it's all about congestion. And as long as an automobile is very convenient, we're going to continue to use them. But right. in areas of very high congestion, it's a pain in the neck. And it's very expensive when you consider that the average car depreciates at the rate of $350 a month. People don't think about depreciation, right. but that's what the cars depreciate at. And they're parked for at least 22 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So why shell out $350 a month for something that's parked 22 hours a day? Well, I'll tell you, I thought about this in a commute recently because there is a solace in driving in your own little cocoon. You've had a tough day or you're going to have a tough day or maybe you don't feel like waiting for that transit to come and pick you up you know, at your house. You're the fifth one to get in the vehicle. You're stepping over people. Somebody spills their coffee on you. It's like being in a bus in a way. And there's still that, you know, maybe that 300 bucks to, to me right now is still worth it to me. Totally agree. And you that's know? why I believe, I, I, by the way, I don't believe the Rethink study. I, I think we will get there, but not by 2030. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with you. I don't think private ownership is going to go away, but it comes down to what can you afford. Right. And if somebody comes along and says, here's how your household can save $5,000 a year, a lot of households are going to jump at that. You bet. Plus See, insurance, I, everything else. See, but, yeah. I think there are two things. One is, you know, you said that, you know, you, you get what you can afford. I would argue that most people get what they can't afford. They, 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 <laughs> that's that's what this industry is built on. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's number one. And then, then number two, you know, you know, Lindsay, as you're saying that, you know, sometimes, you know, just being able to get in your car and, and, and be away from it all, that's, yeah. that's, that's a good thing. Okay. Isn't that predicated in part on the fact that you have spent your life driving cars and therefore that's sort of an expectation that you have and that like maybe for your son he doesn't think it that way mm -hmm. you know he, he just he just thinks you know what yeah. I'll, I'll get into this chariot I'll put in my headphones that's I'll, my I'll, zone out is yeah, my headphones and, and, and I'm just yeah. gonna you know and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna let them take care of the hassle yeah, and yeah. it's just like you know so you think about this chariot thing four bucks one way, I mean, what does it cost to park for an hour in Manhattan, right? Yeah. So, so you got so huge savings, and then plus, you know, somebody else is, is hassling with all that, that stuff. So you're sitting there, and, yeah. and you're really able to relax in a way that you can't while you're driving your car. I, I think it's a great point. We, we we're suburban guys. We're used to not even having to pay for parking in a lot of places right. out here. Uh, when there's a traffic jam, it's not something like a 405 in California that's just going to stymie your whole day. You get around it. So, uh, you know, we, we are, but there's a lot of people in the U.S. which is very expansive, you know, and upper Midwestern states, et cetera, that really don't have a need for what you're talking about. So I, regionally, I think this is going to be something we'll see. Right. Yeah. So speaking of German companies, boy, I thought we'd end up, you know, I thought we'd stop talking about this like last year. Yeah, geez. You're going to bring so, up the D word. 
the, <laughs> the Deutsche word. The Deutsche word. Yeah. So, so what do you make of this uh, collusion? I know you've given a lot of thought to this. I've yeah, read a lot yeah, of your yeah. thought today of uh, yeah. the collusion that seems Look. to be going on with BMW, VW, and Daimler. That's yeah. Th those three companies, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. Audi and Porsche, you know, are, are singled out because even though they're part of VW, but ah. Uh, to me, it makes me sick to my stomach. There's something really going wrong in the automotive industry, and it's not just the Germans. You know, GM and hiding the whole ignition switch defect. Uh, Toyota dragging its feet on the whole unintended acceleration thing, which turned out to be nothing, but they dragged their feet. They fought it. They stymied it. You know, Hyundai having to restate its fuel economy. Uh, uh, a number of suppliers caught colluding to set prices, and there, in fact, there were big fines and even prison sentences. And and this now we, we hear the Germans all colluding on you know how they can circumvent things, especially like emissions. It makes me sick. There's something wrong with this industry right now that really bothers me. I'll bet you, if you look back in history, there's probably, I mean, it's, it's a huge industry. It's a very small community. And if you're working in a certain discipline, engine emissions, the guys in Germany all know each other. You know, the one company you didn't mention was Bosch. You know, I mean, Bosch is a common so technology link, control, hardware, et cetera, that supplies everybody in that regard. It, it's amazed me that the Bosch, until recently, has kind of stayed out of this discussion. And is it another shoe to drop? I don't know. You know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, they were talking about AdBlue, which is the liquid that's used for the selective catalyst reduction. Yeah. Okay, so now, that is an entirely different system than the system that Volkswagen got nicked on in the U.S. Because remember, they didn't have an SCR system, and nobody could understand that, right? And then I remember, what was it, two years ago we were talking about on the show. It's just like, well, how come Mercedes didn't say, like, wait a minute, how can you possibly do this because you don't have that system on your vehicle? Now it seems, I, mean, I don't know, but... Maybe that's because Mercedes knew that even with their system, it wasn't so good. Yeah, it was like, shh, don't royal the, you know, yeah. the wa waters here. Yeah, it, look, like I, I, I said what I said. I, it, it makes me sick. It makes me sick, and we all appreciate diesel for what it is. I mean, it's a CO2 reduction machine as a, compre as a compression ignition engine. It does a great job. We're going to see it in trucks, continue to see it in trucks. This happened right after SCR came on board and the diesel was looking like it was going to continue to gain market share. And so I don't know whether it's torpedo diesel. I mean, we, we're seeing other diesels. We've talked about that here. You know, General Motors and Mazda's coming with a diesel, et cetera. There'll be, it'll be low take rate on those cars for sure. But it's a shame because it is a, it's a great technology. Although we, you know, we had, I uh, remember Craig Trudell from Bloomberg on the show, uh, about a month or so ago, and, uh, and we were talking like, again. We were talking about diesel, and uh, you know, and he's he's more of an industry guy, less of a technical guy. And, and as I recall, he basically said he thought, in terms of uh, you know, for for cars, certainly passenger cars, dead. Hmm. He didn't think it had a chance. Yeah. And I yeah. think that this, you know, that what was it that uh, supposedly uh, Matthias Mueller of, of Volkswagen is going to announce? Uh, I think next week that they're going to, you know fix four, mil four million vehicles in Europe because they want to be proactive in terms of more and more cities beginning to think about banning diesels outright, including Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Rudolf Diesel probably grew up in Stuttgart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. Dr. Diesel is growing, rolling over in his grave on this whole thing, I'm sure. But you're not going to get them out of medium and heavy-duty trucks for an awful long time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, I, I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but I've said this all along. In the U.S., diesels have to meet the exact same emission standards as gasoline engines. So why, why don't you just adopt the U.S. emission standards and then you don't have to ban it unless you're going to ban gasoline at the same time? Yeah. And in fact, we got a, a great question that came in from the diesel forum that says, what if these diesel engines aren't running on diesel fuel, but 100 percent renewable diesel? You know, doesn't that make the problem go away from all this emissions stuff? 
Yeah, it's you're still combusting an air fuel mixture, and something's it's got to go somewhere. So okay, but okay, but it, but I mean, isn't isn't the real? I mean, in terms of the health problem, is the two point five particulates particulates? Yeah. Right. yeah. So does this so stuff have, it, does that have particulates? Well, the renewable stuff. Yeah. That I don't know. I I don't know that. But it uh, might be less. Right. But. These things all have particulate traps. Oh, or maybe. So what's the big deal? Yeah, maybe yeah. they don't have particulate <laughs> traps. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's uh, just a screen yeah. that's not very, yeah. you know, uh, dense or whatever. Lets the flies uh, through. Right, right. <laughs> they colluded on the size of the screen. Well, I mean, be, I, mean I don't know. It, uh, it, it seems seems rather. Uh, yeah. Well, you but, know what's interesting, too, about this whole thing is, if I understand this right, German prosecutors raided Volkswagen and probably Bosch and others trying to dig into where they're cheating on diesel emissions and found all these secret meetings that they're colluding on. I mean, mm -hmm. this is how the story broke. And it'll be fascinating to me to see how Germany goes after this, because, you know, we've and it, we've admired how. The German industry and the German government have worked hand in glove, but it looks like it was a little too much hand in glove. And how are they going to handle it now? Mm -hmm. Because are they going to just give them a slap on the wrist? My gut feel says no. I, I think it's at least going to be big fines. Well, and to, to Gary's earlier point, when you look at, I don't know how many engine plants in Europe are dedicated to diesel engines, but your point about if you do go mass electric, you know, what are the jobs involved in all those machining companies, component companies, assembly plants, et cetera? Diesel's probably a big chunk of employment in, in Germany, Lower Saxony, et cetera, et cetera, you right. know? So. But, but then, you know, also this week, I mean, BMW announced that they're going to have electrified versions of every one of their cars. You know? Porsche announced that they're probably going to eliminate diesels from their cars. Right. Well, Porsche just got a big uh, recall on, or, yeah, on the Cayenne, Cayenne diesel yeah. Yeah. today. Right. So, so, you know, I mean, it, it, it almost seems like there's a certain inevitability. I mean, you have yeah. Volkswagen is, you know, 2025. How many, two million a year or something that they're going to sell uh, electrified vehicles? Yeah. Or? But, you know, let's talk electrified because, you know, a simple stop-start system under some people's definition is electrified. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly mild hybrids, uh, all 48-volt you know, hybrid, that's electrified. So, you know, the general public here is, oh, it's all going to be battery electric vehicles. I mean, that's what they think. Everything's going to be an EV. I keep saying the internal combustion engine is going to be around a long time. Well, and you guys probably talked about this in the aftermath of that Volvo announcement that was so misreported. It was, I, I really, I felt so almost ashamed as a journalist that so many of those stories got out that day. Many of them were corrected again online. Yeah, but Volvo deliberately tried to mislead everybody. Well, well, but, well. but, but also they said, this is the end of the internal combustion. Act. And, and, and shame on our colleagues, because we've all been to technical conferences, business conferences, forecasting conferences. We've all seen that hockey stick graph. Things get really tough in 2019, almost vertical up to 2025. It's going to be a real tough slide. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people forget that hybrid vehicles have combustion engines in them, and they're going to make up so much of this universe in the next 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Well, you know, and to the, to the point of Volvo, though, I mean, I, you know, we, we talk about 2025. I don't think they're all that concerned about 2025 because the number of vehicles that they sell in North America is rather small. Right. Well, so, well so, whatever so the, the, the corresponding so, path with Euro so, so 6 Euro, and beyond. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, so, I mean, that's the issue that these guys are all, all looking at in, in China as well. And, and, you know, Xili is now, you know, which owns Volvo is, is now taking a greater interest in Volvo. And so what does that mean? Um, probably, you know, someone in the government is telling them you will have more electric vehicles and, uh, right they will have more electric vehicles. Yeah. Well, you know, China's had these five-year plans that really haven't been aligned. They've been about as, as high fidelity as Elon Musk's sales projections <laughs> and production <laughs> projections. You know, they come out and it, it's a classic kind of, you know, governed economy. We're going to do this and then it doesn't happen. So the latest one, I think, is the most aggressive and we'll have to see if that plays out. And aren't you getting your Model 3 tomorrow? I understand that tomorrow's the big day for Model 3s. I tomorrow. heard I'm in line a, a hundred after you. Oh, so okay. a, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Right. <laughs> hey, I know we got a lot more to talk about, but we're going to take another break right now. We got to give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. And I noticed this Honda Odyssey happens to be rolling on Bridgestone. <laughs> We're back. All right, so 
What do you guys make of the UK saying 2040 internal combustion engines done? I mean, they, they. That's their, you know, you were talking about Chinese five year plans yeah. that don't happen. Yeah. This is, you know, the 25 year plan that's not going to happen. Well, and we've, we've heard this with the French government too, the, these kind of things. And it's interesting because we, the three of us, go to a lot of industry conferences, okay? And it's kind of like there's that zone after 2025. Usually companies take it to 2030 and they say by 2030 and they make a big pronouncement because. The person doing the presentation isn't going to be around then. He'll be retired. He or she will be retired. None of us will be around then. So it's just you kind of say, well, that's going to happen in the future. And, you know, a, a lot of things happen. I mean, you think of the things that haven't been predicted, that, that, that we have today that weren't predicted. You know, the minivan wasn't predicted. SUV boom wasn't predicted. Shale oil in North America wasn't that's predicted. Right. So, so what could possibly happen? External events between now and, let's say, the next 10 years that take us out to the middle of next decade to say what could possibly change that? I mean, you know, people, are people going to be able to afford the switchover? I don't know how long the, the vehicle park in Britain lasts. It's got to be as probably as old as ours, 10, 15 years old. So what happens when you get to 2025 and 2030 and you're looking at a one and a half year product cycle till that 2040? And if you're not even close to being there, what's going to happen? And the politicians, we forgot about them. They'll all be out of office and, <laughs> and gone. So. Uh, but it is a way of government saying that they're putting, you know, that they're putting a time frame on this transformation, which includes autonomous vehicles as well. They've got a stake in some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's so, my view. So, so, so speaking of the politicians um, and the apparently the way that all politicians now communicate to people. So Twitter. So, <laughs> so, 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 so right. Right. Sadiq Khan, who is the mayor of London, um, he tweeted out, Londoners can't afford to wait until 2040 for the government to phase out polluting cars. We need a diesel scrappage fund now to ta tackle toxic air. Not easy to say. What will that cost them? Who, you know, who's going to pay for yeah. that? And, and again, you know, it comes back to, is your goal to ban cars or is your goal to clean up the air? Well, I think it's to clean the air because uh, King's College estimates that uh, 9,400 pr premature deaths happen each year in the UK. So... Mm. You know, what's the price of that? Right. Yeah, so. no, and, and that's a great point. You've got to put the, the, the price on that. But, you know, I think they're, they're doing this, again, I say, over here, the diesel engines got to meet the same standard as gasoline engines. And if you want to burn, ban the internal combustion engine, you know, one of the things that's never talked about uh, electric cars is how energy intensive they are to manufacture and the fact that, and we talked about this a little bit with Sandy Monroe. Nobody knows how to recycle these things in high vo the batteries in high volume for a profit. And, mm. and Sandy made a great point. We're going to have to overhaul our electrical grid. Completely. And it's very vulnerable to cyber attack. And I looked it up. What they're talking about, the cost of fixing that yeah. is $2 trillion. Well, what do you think that's going to do to your electrical rates? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they're going to go up. And all of a sudden, you're going to be looking at, hmm, the gasoline's way cheaper and it's pretty clean. Except you need electricity to run those pumps. And oh, so no, yeah. So when there's that cyber yeah. attack, yeah. you know, we're screwed, no yeah. gasoline. Speaking of gasoline, okay, so, so just <laughs> perfect segue, we're here. Yes. So, so this was an interesting uh, development I discovered. The American Petroleum Institute reported that U.S. crude inventories fell by 10.2 million barrels. Well, what does that mean? Well, probably nothing except for the fact that they'd only expected it to fall by 2.6. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it fell by 10.2. And then it so happens, and nobody talks about OPEC anymore, and they basically had a meeting in, uh, of all places, St. Petersburg, Russia. And um, so they are talking about uh, continuing reduced output by 1.8 million barrels per day beyond March 2018. And so they're looking at limiting exports. Now, we'd all say, well, you know, the shale oil thing is going to take care of us. It won't be a problem. And that's in just North America. That's but we're exporting a lot of that, too. Right. Yeah. So I'm sort of wondering, is, is this maybe portend that we're going to get into a situation where gasoline prices, maybe not immediately, but maybe in a year or two, will begin a march north? What do you think? 
I think that could very well happen. Um, it, it's a strange environment right now. We don't have government that's pushing for things like electrified cars. So the market is kind of keeping that, you know, two, three percent of sales. Even in California, look what they're trying to do is kickstart again and give incentives and so forth and so on. You know, the baseline is that fuel is still cheap. So uh, I, I don't know why the inventories are, are falling. Yeah, I don't either, except that the only way that inventories can fall is if we're consuming so much more and or we're not producing as much or a balance between or, you know, a combination of the two. But yeah, look, the oil industry would love to see oil at at least $65 a barrel. They would love to see it there all day long, higher if possible. Market forces have not allowed that to happen. And if you believe this move to electrification is really going to take off, and if you believe this move to ride sharing and car sharing is going to mean that we are going to need a lot less cars, Bloomberg Energy uh, Investment is predicting a collapse in oil prices around 2022 because of these things. So yeah, I think we will see a run up in gasoline. I don't think it's gonna be huge unless there's some war or something that triggers a spike. But if market forces just roll out, the industry, the oil industry will do everything it can to get oil up to about $65 a barrel if it can. But look, you're, you're marching against electrification. You're marching against possibly fewer cars. But Okay, so, so one of the things that, we, you know, we, we heard the, the um, um, Ford and, and General Motors and FCA reported their uh, uh, second quarter numbers. And, uh, you know, you've got to believe that a lot of that comes from pickup trucks and SUVs. I mean, they all did very well. So if, if we follow this line of we're going to have increased fuel prices going forward, then what happens to their profitability in the foreseeable future. It goes down. Well, you look at F FCA, that Morgan Stanley report last week, uh, if you believe those numbers. The what, what'd they say? I missed that. Well, well the, the Jeep is basically 70 plus, plus percent of, of, their profits. of their profits. Right. You know, just amazing. So, um, you know. Jeep isn't actually doing particularly well right and, now. And, and that was in the face of their sales being down, although Mike Manley said that they we're, we're kind of right on where we should be. And, and he told me that almost six months ago. Right. He, he said, look, the first half, we're not going to look good at all. So they knew this was coming. You know, they got rid of. Uh, so how are they going to look better in the second half? I mean. There's not going to be a whole lot of people buying Trailhawks, I can't imagine. I mean, no, they got a new Wrangler, but that's not till the end of this year. Right. So, I mean, so, the but will it be, for, up, will it be for sale? Uh, it's going to be. It's going to break cover at the LA show, I think. So, so no. Gonna, no. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, they they did the tool change over, plant change over for the Compass. They're still, I don't believe, back up to, you know, full levels of that. They do have the new Wrangler coming. They've got uh, the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer coming. I think that's next year. 2019. No, yeah. you're right. So, I mean, no, Jeep's good. And, you know, we're looking at their sales down in the U.S. I don't think that's true globally outside of the U.S. I believe their sales are up, especially in China. So, uh so they'll be fine from that standpoint. But yeah, look, I mean, you're, you're right, Gary. I mean, if, if they don't have these trucks and SUVs to sell, their profits are going down. And that's why I, I think GM, I think this is a key reason why they sold off Opal. If, if you're looking to a, a world of fewer cars in the future, you better start cutting back right now. Mm -hmm. You better not build another plant again, right? ever. <laughs> Yeah. It's not very encouraging for uh, all those people who are sitting out there saying, gee, <laughs> we like to build new buildings and stick machinery inside them. Oh, yeah. I know. And, uh, but, you know, you were at the machinery company today that says we're looking forward to, you know, one-fifth the machine tools being needed for an electric car. I I'm glad they're saying that sort of thing and, and saying it publicly because this is something that not only the industry is going to have to grapple with, any region that is automotive centric, i.e. where we're sitting right now, better start dealing with it because we've got huge societal problems coming if these trends turn out to be, and, it's, and some of these projections turn out to be true. Well, it's interesting, you know, the industry when it looked like, you know, GM's bankruptcy, et cetera, you know, 
industry people were making the case that you have, you know, a, a multipl big multiplier on every assembly plant job, and it gets down to where you were today, Gary. I mean, machine tool guys, people that cut the grass, the whole thing. I mean, you think of that cascade in terms of employment and a lot of people on the dole uh, if, you know, when you start to cut these things. Um, it scares me. Yeah. It truly does. Yeah. I'm, I'm very worried about if this stuff pans out, what the hell we're going to do. Yeah. And, and so Model 3, <laughs> are we going to see at 300000 is everybody going to take their $1,000 deposit and get a car, if you guys think? Well, he pr he'll probably announce the Model 4, and then people <laughs> will take their, their um, deposit from the Model 3 and then apply it to the Model 4, right. at which point the Model 5 begins to look really good. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, and, and his solution, I mean, he, he's announced an electric pickup truck, which is the bread and butter of America. You know, you know no matter if oil prices go up, et cetera, as we've seen, Americans aren't going to stop wanting to drive pickup trucks. So what's the alternative? You know, this minivan, does it get electrified? Do pickup trucks get electrified? And does Tesla then have some sort of in? But we, we'd figure that GM, Ford, and Chrysler would be doing the same thing. But think about it this way, too. We're talking about what happens if car sales go down and, yeah. you know, how do the big guys, you know, the GMs, the Fords, the Toyotas, the, the, the Volks, how do they survive in that world? I was at a conference this week and somebody said it's going to be far easier for Tesla to get to 500,000 than it is for General Motors to lose several million units of production. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Well, that's kind of assuming that the electrification brand will be Tesla. But as we've seen, I mean, bolts, you know, 200 days supply in bolts. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you would have thought they would have picked up some of that to people who are kind of brand agnostic or maybe GM people. It's kind of assuming that they're going to be carrying a pretty big ball in terms of electrification. Tesla right, but, is. But even if, it isn't, even if it isn't Tesla and if it's Faraday Future or Lucid or somebody else, I mean, so I think the point is, is that for these up and coming companies, they're going to be growing, presumably, right. Right, while the traditional, traditional auto manufacturers are going to be trying to figure out how to shrink or how to do other things. Right. I mean, no, so, I so, I mean, to go back to the chariot thing, you know, if Ford is, is you know, it's got chariots in San Francisco, New York, you know, it's, it's rolling out in several other cities. I mean, to the point of, okay, if they begin doing that and they're taking, you know, 10 cars out per, and as you say, you know, a couple of them got to be fusions or Mustangs or whatever, right? Right. Um, you know, Jim Hackett is probably sitting there trying to, to figure out, okay, you know, how many transit can, transits can we build for chariot applications as we begin to lose, right. to, to, you know, it, if not to us, yeah. then to all those ride-hailing apps that are going to right. displace, you know, new car purchases. I think that's a bigger threat because I think some of these Lucids and these guys, I'm not saying they're all going to fail, but for them to get up to scale where they can have a return on investment and, and have a break-even point, it's going to be a tough slog for these guys. We've already seen Faraday, you know, the axe their plant, uh, their plan for their plant, et cetera. So I, I think I think the 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 ride hailing ride sharing dynamic is maybe going to be more important. Yeah, and just imagine a transit plant, and let's just say for argument's sake, rule of thumb in the industry, you can build two hundred and fifty thousand of them a year. That's two and a half million cars you're pulling out. Yeah. of the market overall. That one plant can wipe out, what would that be? Uh, four, eight, ten other plants. One plant has the capability of wiping out the need for production of ten other plants. Well, what it gets into, I mean, Honda, we talked to them today. I mean, you know, probably the leading company in terms of flexibility and fast changeovers. I mean, they move cars around plants, within plants, they move models, probably as good or better than anybody. Mm -hmm. So they'll have some sort of advantage. I mean, we've already heard, you know, the GM guys in this Hamtramck uh, kind of debacle with Sonic and with Bolt and with Volt. I mean, they're talking about mid-sized cars, you know? I mean, it's the first time we've heard, you know, big nameplates, Impala. What do you do with it? I mean, Impala, it's, it's part of their brand, you know? That it's Well, it's all going to come down to if you can't make money on it, what the hell are you investing you bet. to build a new one for? You bet. You know, so you think of forward product plans in this environment. They're probably not bailing right now, but I mean, they're, they're starting to think about so, these things. It's a great you point. Know, up until this discussion or 
very recently I thought, wow, Mazda, how do they go forward? I mean, they make about a million cars a year. They're profitable, but how do they go forward? And, and Subaru, they make about a million cars a year and they're profitable, how do they go forward? Everyone needs scale, right? Yeah. Maybe they're the survivors. Right. And maybe the, uh, the Volkswagens and the Toyotas and the General Motors are not the survivors. You know, it's the old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The advantage may be to those who can operate on relatively smaller volume, and not relatively, on smaller volumes, yeah. and still be able to make a profit. The one thing Subaru and Mazda don't have is all the Zev stuff that you need to get there, which is this big billion plus dollar investment. I mean, then, they then don't a, have a venture capital firm will come in and buy them up. Or, yeah. or they just buy the technology. Yeah. Or they buy the technology, right? So, you know, that would probably be a better play for them. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It is, and it's scary. But with that, we're going to wrap up the show. <laughs> <laughs> On that ominous note. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lindsey Brooke, thanks so much for coming over, man. Thanks, John. It's always really a blast. good having you as always. Always a blast. Gary, Thank always you good. Great, great topics that you brought up. Really good mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. And all of you, thanks for having tuned in, and we'll be back at it here again next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. year I was talking with Charlie Hughes, if you guys remember him, Charlie Land Rover. With, with Land Rover What's and he Mazda. And he's a consultant. Oh. And uh, we, we got talking about all this stuff. And he said he thought that the airline business is the model for where the automotive industry is going. You've got about a half a dozen major airframe makers in the world. Uh, you've got in the United States now only three major airlines and a couple of smaller ones. Like three engine makers. It's like three engine makers. You know, you get on a plane, do you give a shit what, what yeah, it is? Be Pratt and & Whitney and Rolls-Royce, right? I think so, yeah. 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 Right. And uh, so, you, you know, I'll look at the card to see what, what am I on? You know, is it an Airbus, is it a Boeing, is it an Embraer or whatever? But it, I'm not gonna say, oh, you know, the, the old saying Jim Hall always used, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But and you have your father, who's a VP of marketing, and that, that, that was, uh, that, that's exactly. I'm a right. Tupolev man myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you at the OPEC conference? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, is that where it's going? You know, a half a dozen or so major car makers, and you know, three major you know mobility suppliers, and a few regional ones. You know, and it varies by by country and all, but. I, I think that he might have something there. Mm. I heard recently, too, I was at the Umtree Powertrain Conference last week, and you guys know uh, Tim Johnson from Corning. Really good technical guy that it's his job at Corning to look at these advanced trends and how that's going to impact their business. And uh, he made a point that I thought was interesting. You know, it's like, if you're an automaker, how do you pay for this the vertical part of the curve that is just adding particulate filters and it's adding, you know, hybridization, electrification, all the stuff you can't sell in a vehicle. Um, you pay for it with autonomy. And he really believes that autonomy is to cover the cost for the automakers because there's technologies there that cost them two cents and they can charge a thousand dollars for it. Um, and I really hadn't heard that, but I mean, he, he had some slides that kind of supported that as well. But uh, how do you make, uh, I'm not sure I follow. Autonomy and connected, and, and all the connected services and connected cars, why the industry's pushing on this, because they oh. can't afford. So they'll, they'll, they'll make money off the data. They'll make money off the data, and that's going to cover the cost of increasingly stringent global emission standards in these but, vehicles. But will they have the access to the data? Will they be able to control it? Good question. I, I, I'll tell you, because I did an interview earlier this year with, uh, uh, who's the guy that's doing uh, Faraday Future, the car? Uh, Pete Savagian? No, 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 no. Um, the 
Peter Rawlinson. Peter Rawlinson. Oh, yeah. And we had uh, him and a uh, guy from... No, he's, uh, Rawlinson's lucid. No, no, no. That's uh, Nick Sampson. Nick Sampson, correct. And so, Peter Rawlinson... I'm getting my former, uh, Brit former Lotus engineers mixed up. <laughs> former Lotus Tesla engineers <laughs> that's right, mixed that's up. That's right, that's right. But anyway, it, it, was, it was Rawlinson, and I'm blanking out on the guy's name right now from Mobileye. And we got talking about data. Oh, yeah, we're all going to make money off the data and everything. And I said, well, who's getting access to the data? And they both said, like, we did. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's like, well, you guys are working together. Who gets access to the data? And, oh, they didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Wow. Then that's why I ask, yeah. is the OEM really going to have control of the data? This is why I believe, yeah. you know, Waymo's only gotten anywhere with FCA. Mm -hmm. Because everybody else is like, the hell we're going to let Google take all this data. Right. The hell we are. So that's why I think the GMs and the Fords and the Toyotas and the Volkswagens are all trying to develop this stuff in-house so that they maintain control. Right. But I don't know if they're going to be able to. You know how this, this sort of reminds me of, and you guys will certainly remember this. Remember when they started Covizent? Because, mm -hmm. they, because they basically thought they'd make a lot of money off of having those uh, online reverse, exchanges, reverse yeah. auctions, and yeah. stuff like that, and uh, that they would, they would then own it, and they had, you know, that the three of them put it together. How'd that work out? Terrible. Although they still exist, it still amazes me to hear they exist. No, you know? no, but it exists as, 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 a, as a completely different company. But, yeah, 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 right. But I mean, exactly. but the point is, is that is that I would this change was, it. This was, you know, we're not going to make money off of selling cars. We're going to make money off of having the online exchanges. Yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. And, and right, and it's just right. was like, yeah. Well, so so, who's going to own the data? Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And uh, but the real problem, of course, is with with Covacent was they never talked to, the suppliers didn't want this at all so your customer hates what you're trying to do that ought to tell you something right there yeah. mm -hmm. and when it comes to data people are, <laughs> right. are scared yeah what do you mean they're going to collect all this data on me i'm not going to have that done and then when they tell me that i say do you have a cell phone yeah i got a cell phone well <laughs> yeah. too late cookies <laughs> yeah. I know. right right so i don't know it's, uh, See those Roombas might start selling the data of yeah, the, I saw that. people's houses. Right. Uh, unbelievable. And, 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 you know, the machine learning and everything just keeps getting more intelligent. There was some, I, I was searching things on the web the other day, and, and this, something was following me around like the same ad was following me, and I thought, God, it's like a tick, you know? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's like something I had searched for like two days earlier it, that I, I was going to buy. And it, it, you just go, oh, my God. Well, here's one for today. So I'm in my office up in Troy, and this guy's walking in the office. And I thought, I know this guy. And it was Neil Hanneman, who had been chief engineer under Roy Schoberg on Viper. He did all the development driving. He, he led all the vehicle dynamics, the whole thing. So he went from there to Saline, and then Chris Theodore poached him to work on Ford GT. And the last time I saw him, I forget what he was doing, and I said, what is going on? He was in for a vehicle autonomy 101 course that some of our guys were teaching there that was like sold out weeks ago. The, the most, and, and I asked a couple people, and, and I said, you know, could I have learned something? No, this was like on the most basic level, you know, fully under, you know, everybody could understand. And so Neil says, I got to get into this. He hands me this business card, F-A-C-T, fact. And it's a, uh, like an expert witness kind of thing where he's doing a lot of stuff on, um, you know, was, was the driver's foot in the right place when this crash happened? And he's, he's replicating crash scenes on racetracks and these kind of things for evidence. And he lives out in like Seattle. And so it was ironic that this guy who developed one of the most visceral, mechanical, they intentionally kept like ABS off the car. Right. It was just a pure driver's car. And, and, and I said, how do you feel about this, you know? Now he's making a robot pod. And yeah. And, and he says, it's just, it's fascinating, but like, I got to go there, yeah. you know? So I would think as an engineer, you'd welcome the challenge, but we got to yeah. close out so that they can get yeah. this thing out of the studio. Yeah, I think... Uh